Welcome to Buckets. Win totals are out. My name is Matt Moore. I'm the senior NBA writer for the Action Network. I'm joined by Jim Turvey and Joe Delera. You can find them in the Action Network app and on Twitter at TurveyBets and at Joe Delera. This is your NBA win totals. First impressions, way too early. Gotta bet them now episode. We're going to talk about some of our favorite bets that came out. Win totals just hit the market. They came out on Sunday. We've been in the action slack salivating, waiting for these numbers to drop. Uh, some of us have already put bets in. Some of us are planning on putting bets in immediately after this episode is posted. Uh, we're going to get into those. As always, everything we talk about can be found in the award-winning Action Network app. I'll have lots of content out this week based off of these win totals, including I'm going to get you a sense of what the power rating actually translates to for these teams. Like You can take the win totals and you can build a spread for like a theoretical matchup. So I'm going to have an article on that. I'll have a breakdown of like the most interesting ones. We're not going to go like super hardcore because again, these things just came out and there's time for us to figure out. Uh, we have, we have three months in order to figure out these teams before the opening night tips off, but we do want to get to some of this media stuff. A reminder, make sure to go check out youtube.com slash the action network. Big bats on campus is back. They've been posting their preview episodes for the college football season. I am going on vacation next week. And like my wife asked me, she's like, what do you want to do on vacation? And I was like, I want to sit on a deck by the ocean and I want to listen to college football podcasts while I read my Athlon college football preview. <laughs> Athlon, oh man. That I am. Um, and she's like, okay, yes, but also spend time with your family. And I was like, sure, yes, that too. Um, I was like, will there be beer? Um, go check it out, youtube.com slash the action network. All right, we're going to run down our best bets. I, I asked the guys for ones that they are at least going to bet a little bit on. We've got five from Jim, three from Joe. I've got five. I want to start with Jim. We'll go around the table. We're going to talk about our favorite one, the one that we think is the best bet, and then we'll get to the other ones. But we're going to run down the whole slate right now. Jim Turvey, let's start with you. Give me your five best bets for NBA win totals. Five best bets. We've got the Warriors over 43.5. The Rockets over 41.5, the Bulls under 30.5, the Hawks over 34.5, and the Raptors under 31.5. All right. Joe Delera, who, after I asked him to be on this podcast, said, you know, I kind of hate win totals. And I was like, thanks, Joe. Appreciate you doing that after I'd already committed you to the podcast. Uh, what are your three po- what are the three bets that you like the best? Not enough plus numbers here. So I like the uh, I like the Grizzlies over 45 and a half. I like the Celtics under 58 and a half and the Orlando Magic under 47 and a half. Okay. Um, also, I want to talk about this with both Joe and Jim. If you hear these bets, you're going to hear them talk about them. But one of the things that they will say here, and this is very important, they are going to be more interested in alt numbers on a lot of these because there's better value, as you kind of heard from Joe there, wanting those those juicy plus numbers. The escalators are always in effect here. So you're going to want to keep an eye on on that. As we look at these numbers, you don't, like one, the books are going to limit you anyway. They're not going to take a lot of money right now. But two, as you kind of look at these, some of this might be, hey, I like this number. I'm going to like it a lot better when I can get a plus 250, plus 285 on a lower or higher number than even what the market has started out with. Uh, My five, Thunder over 56 and a half. Detroit Pistons over 22 and a half. The New York Knicks under 52 and a half, Joe Delera. The New Orleans Pelicans over 45 and a half. And the Denver Nuggets under 52 and a half. Okay. Let's talk about one of our favorite bets from each of these. Let's start with Joe Delera. Joe of these three, Magic under 47 and a half, Grizzlies over 45 and a half, Celtics under, which is the one that you like the best? I like the Memphis Grizzlies over 45 and a half wins. Um, the reason I like this bet the most is I like, look, I know a lot of us were on the Grizzlies last year. Um, I know you and Brandon were on them to a greater extent than I was, but still, we all <laughs> like the Grizzlies, right? Um, I think that when you look at 
in terms of what happened really like last year was just a debacle for a variety of different reasons there were so many injuries obviously desmond bain missed a lot of time john morant missed the bulk of the season for personal reasons uh suspension related and you know and he was also injured as well stephen adams didn't play the entire season he was somebody that all of us thought was important from a spacing perspective from a play from a playing perspective from a leadership perspective that he was important for that locker room mark smart didn't play a lot either so it's like you have had all these guys that like you expected to play nobody really got any run um they were one of the worst teams really like over the course of the season but that's part of why i like them this year um i think they've had an opportunity to bring in some players i like the addition of zach e i know if you guys listen to the buckets podcast when we did the draft we gave that out for him to be a top 10 pick um and that was a nice plus money number and i think that he fits really well with what memphis is going to want to do he's a good screener he's a good roller um he's not the most explosive but that's not what they needed they don't need a rim runner they have, you know, John Moran can do all of the rim running on his own. Um, and I think that one of the most important things about last season was because Morant wasn't there and Bain even missed a lot of time. But when Bain and Jaron Jackson Jr. had to like run the offense for the most part, I think that they saw a huge jump in terms of what their responsibilities were. So they would never need that type of usage with John Morant, with even with Marcus Smart also sharing the court with them. But because they didn't have that, you started to see them have to take on the number one defensive assignments for other teams. Uh, that's who they were getting game planned against. And you saw Bain kind of increase what he could do, what he could provide. You saw Jaron Jackson Jr. He went from about like four ISOs a game to over 10 ISOs a game. And he was still scoring over one point per possession on those isolations, which is actually really good, especially for a guy who'd never really had that type of volume. So I think that when you bring in Morant, when you bring in Edie, when you bring in uh, Marcus Smart for the full season, you're going to be able to see a team that's gotten to practice together, gotten to play together, and they're going to be coming out ripping and roaring because they are all going to be pretty rested too off of a long off season. So I like them to go over 45 and a half. I think you can play them to win the division at three to one. Um, and I'll be looking for some alts, whether it's 50 plus 55 plus number one seed in the West. Um, I think that there's a high ceiling for the Memphis Grizzlies coming off of a bounce back year. I will get here on this one. Like I, I know that by the time that the season tips off, I will be on this and an alt over. We did guess the win total last week, and we did very well, by the way. All of us were within, if you average it out, we were within one game off. Uh, awesome. I, I was second, losing to Andrew uh, O'Connor Watts by 0 0.1 on, on the average. That's not frustrating for me at all. Uh, <laughs> with the Grizzlies, I tabbed them at 49.5. And they both had him at 48 and a half. And we talked a lot about how difficult I wanted to do that one because it was so difficult. Do you project them closer to where they were two years ago? Or do you really look at last year and think that they took a step back? I, I There I are think, a lot of reasons. Go ahead. Go, I, know, I was going to say, like, I, I think that last year was good for them in the fact that, like, they were able to get experience to certain players that never would have been able to do that had John Moran played a full season. Like Jaron Jackson Jr. never sees that much volume. Desmond Bain never sees that much volume. Gigi Jackson uh, never sees that much volume. So like they, they've really improved, I think, down the roster because they were missing so many key players. And like the thought process was like, hey, like we're going to let these guys get some run. Like we're not, we're, we need to see if these guys are going to fit in our long-term plans. And I think that, you know, maybe there's some questions deeper on the bench but I, I think the Memphis is a lot better than they were situated even two years ago. I mean, look, they found Vince Williams Jr. He was really good. Scotty Pippen yep. Jr. was actually really good, and he's been pretty good in, in summer league. So they found other guys. I will feel a lot better if Zaire Williams is is – how can I put this? Given another opportunity to grow elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I really want good things for that kid. It's just like they traded up to get him and I hated the trade up and then I hated the pick and then I hated the player. And so it's been like this compounding. I'm in it's I'm in mall rats. That kid's on the fucking escalator. I'm just really annoyed <laughs> all the time um, with Zaire. Will and like they've slowly started to get rid of that bench unit, which was a disaster. Uh, LaRavia, et cetera. 
Marcus Smart coming back, I think, is actually going to be pretty helpful. If you look at Marcus Smart, he actually led the team only in 20 games played, but he led an EPM. He was still hugely impactful defensively, and I kind of think that's going to be the case this year. I will get there. I need a little bit more time to figure out exactly how I want to play it because the the one thing I will say is, like, I don't think the numbers – I can't have sit here and given them a 49.5 and and then say this number is right. This is definitely the books being like, look, it's been two years. We don't know what to expect. Jim, I'm curious your thoughts on this. Just like, do they just like snap back? Are they way better? They brought in a new offensive coach, which is supposed to like really bring some innovation, which I think that they've needed. Like I, it's, there's a lot of unknowns, but if we kind of like, if we tear through that jungle of unknown, we know that there's the bones of a really good team here. Yeah, I'm basically where you're at. So I've been talking to obviously Joe and Brandon a lot as these win totals and divisions and all this stuff pops. And I I feel myself slipping into the same trap I fell into with the Thunder last year, where I was high on the Thunder. And then all the like people in my bubble were even higher than me. And I kind of zagged and was like, no, I'm going to be the low person on the Thunder. And then after I was like, I overthought this. And I feel like it's happening with the Grizzlies again. I feel like in a normal world, I'd be like, yeah, I'm high on the Grizzlies, but I'm surrounded by you know, the two highest people on the Grizzlies. And now I'm like, well, I don't like them that much. So maybe I like an under, I think I'm with you. I'll come around on the over eventually, but I do have my biggest question, honestly, is Jaron Jackson Jr. I do think that there is the potential that he stalled out a little bit. I think Joe makes a good point that potentially we're seeing that it wasn't stalling out as much as he just couldn't handle a bigger role. But I see a lot of stuff that just showed that he kind of stalled out. And I am a little bit worried. You know, I I do think Stephen Adams was really, really essential on many, many levels. Like you mentioned the leadership part of it, Joe, but also like his offensive rebounding kept their offense alive in the half court. That was always your thing, Matt, is that they really don't have a good half court offense, but Stephen Adams got those tip outs and kept them going and going, going. Jaron Jackson Jr. does not do that. You know, Zach Eady maybe gets to that tier eventually. He's not going to enter the league as a rookie and be at the tier to be able to float an offense with offensive rebounding the way that Stephen Adams as a vet and who would perfected that tip out really was able to do so i i have more questions on memphis than than joe and brandon but again i think i'm like questioning like the 52 and a half and i should just hit the over 45 and a half because i i do overall quite like memphis yeah i think there's also probably a division play to be found in here and um i'll talk about the pelicans here shortly which is another reason i'm a little bit bearish on that but um yeah i think I think that they're going to be a fascinating team. I do believe like by the end, I'll definitely be on them. Jim of the five that you've got, what's your favorite best bet? Yeah, my favorite is the Warriors. So they're listed at 43 and a half. They won 46 games last year. They were, you know, true talent, 46 win team as well. I don't see this team getting worse. The, the off season is losing clay and losing Chris Paul two vets to, you know, one staple of the organization, mm-hmm. one who had a pretty solid year in his first year with the team. But I really quietly, quietly like the offseason they've had. Um, D'Anthony Melton, Kyle Anderson, and Buddy Heald are all guys that, especially the first two, that I really think you can kind of slot into a lot of teams, do really well. Melton being next to Curry is is really intriguing to me in lineups. I think he can cover up a lot of, of what Curry hands off on the defensive end. And then Buddy Heald as you know, providing some of that shooting that, that is going out the door in clay. I think that their offseason is quietly really strong. And that's before we even get to the potential of Lori Markin. Now, not even not all of the books are hanging this number, but you can find it out there. And that's part of why I'm intrigued by it. You know, the, the, the books are holding off a little bit because of the potential of the Lori Markin. And they are kind of the leaders in the clubhouse now with, with the, in terms of the rumors. But I like this even without Lori. You know, last season, we had 55 games of Draymond. Now, at this point at this point in his career, how much more can we expect? Uh, on the, the Same with Gary Payton. Missed a lot of games, but how much can we really expect? Steph did play 74. The health side of this is the downside. But I'm going to say this. You're going to hear me say this word time and time and time again because it really is something that I, I try to – I probably, if anything, maybe slightly overweight, but I do think it's important in the modern uh, – the modern NBA for the regular season win totals is depth, 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 depth. And the Warriors really have some quietly really nice depth that you always make fun of the, 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 the light years ahead, two generations, whatever. But, but the, the youngsters are playing pretty well. Trace Jackson Davis, Jonathan Kaminga, Brandon Pazemski, even Moses Moody, maybe more theoretical than in reality. But I, I really like those pieces that they have. Now, maybe they go out the door for Laurie Markkinen, but then you have a much higher ceiling in a, 
really nice starting five if he does come in. So I, I don't see this team as having gotten worse. I do think the bottom of the West got a little bit better. So maybe that's how you can make the argument that their number goes down. But I think this team actually got better in the offseason and has the potential to get even better if some of the young players take a leap or if they are able to bring Laurie Markkinen in. I don't think it's a bad bet. It's also not a bet, not a bet I want. Uh, and so I, I wrote an article about this. I've done off-season moves. I actually went through using estimated wins from dunks and threes. I converted that to a spread value and then basically did the in and out over replacement player value of what the average player is worth of the spread um, and did the, in, the, the pluses and the minuses and applied that to last season's power rating with a little bit of manual adjustment. So that's the, the approach that I went through. And when you do that, what's interesting is I agree that it's like, you know, Clay was kind of washed last year. And like, hey, like <laughs> Anthony Melton is like a really good player. And I'm on that train. The problem is like the the numbers I'm and you don't have to use this. You could use BPM. You can use uh, just flat out per 100. There's a lot of ways to do this. But the system that I used was like, no, 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 no. Clay Thompson's like a guy in this league. Like he's worth like a point to the spread. And Chris Paul is worth like half a point. And Kyle Anderson is worth minus 0. 0.1. Um, <laughs> and Buddy Heald's worth 0. 0.6, which is like about the Chris Paul. That makes sense to me. It's like you had a pure shooter. You lose Chris Paul's playmaking. That's kind of a wash. You gained the Anthony Melton 0. 0.3 last year. Now, Melton was hurt with a back injury. Yeah. So I think that's a large reason why his impact was kind of muted. And I do expect him to kind of bounce back. So like, this isn't like a pure thing. Based off of all this and where I had them last year, I actually have them power rated. Like I have them as having been worse last year than their record. Now, clean the glass disagrees in terms of point differential Pythagorean, like their expected number. It was 46, like right on the dot. So that does get you a little bit of clearance here. My problem here is more. Um, there is always a concern for me when you add guys that are not drafted by golden state, because they've never played an emotion offense. Kelly Oubre is like a perfectly fine NBA player. He's played for a bunch of teams. He's not bad. He's not awesome. He's not totally reliable. He is perfectly fine and gave good minutes for Philadelphia last year. He looked like the dumbest fucking player on the planet because he couldn't figure out how to play around the Warriors system. And so like, I worry about a guy like Buddy Heald in that, in that kind of setup. Like on the surface, oh my God, there's so much shooting on this team. So it all looks good. Kaminga definitely took a step forward last year, but then he kind of tailed out. Joe, I'll get your thoughts on this, but m my biggest concern, Jim, is that really quietly over the back 30 games, Steph finally, finally started to decline. And when that starts, to, like, when that magical journey of unicorn shitting rainbows ends the bottom falls the fuck out here. And so that could be really bad. Do you want to respond to that before I, I get Joe, Joe's thoughts? I think it's a fair, I think it, the, the Curry thing is probably the most fair uh, pushback on, on all of it. Cause I do think that like to the, to the, the worries about Buddy Heald, I think that's fair, but I feel like you couldn't handpick a better player to fit into a system like this than Kyle Anderson. I feel like, you know, when you mentioned yeah. your spread adjustments, negative 0.1, like I think Kyle Anderson's going to fit in absolutely perfectly. Yeah, to this system. So, yep. so I, again, there's, there's give and take on both sides of that. I do think the Curry thing is a fair uh, assessment, but I, I think that, you know, you, you said the bottom falls out when Curry goes. I see Curry actually as a guy who the bottom isn't ever going to fully fall out. I, I think mm. because of his, gravitational pull and because of like the way he is going to age i actually don't think the bomb will fall i think it will i think there is it is fair to notice that he slipped a little bit but i it part of steph's value has always been the fear of steph and i think that you know you see it in across sports where fear lasts longer than actual impact sometimes so even yeah. if steph isn't hitting at that same level i think the gravitational value of steph will still be there even if he's not at the full flamethrower mode I'm less concerned about the bottom falling out with Steph. I'm more concerned with this team is radically and more and more shifted to where it's like Steph used to, it used to be the team empowered Steph and Steph made them gods. And then it became, okay, the team is still pretty good and Steph makes them great. And then the last two years it's been, okay, so the team's not great, but Steph makes them good. And so if Steph's just ability to raise the floor diminishes just like a little a little bit 
then it can like I think there were it, I think it can start a, a negative feedback loop, especially with how volatile Draymond is. Joe, what are your thoughts on this Warriors play over forty three and a half? I, my inclination was at first like I liked it uh, when when Jim had said it. Um, my my thought with the Warriors is like kind of to echo what Jim had said. I like who they brought in. I like that you're you know taking minutes away from a guy like Clay Thompson. As good as I think that Clay is, like I think that we've kind of overstated like how bad he was right like he still was putting up 18 points a game roughly um like he still was important but i do think that you know replacing him with a guy like buddy healed who is one of the only players that has really been able to keep up with steph in a way like in terms of volume from three-point range um and he's maybe somebody that in this offense is somebody that we have to be a little bit concerned about with our like automatic free money glitch with uh with steph curry to lead the league in threes right so i i do think though that one of the most important things for this team is because like they're a little bit older, um, they are trying to capture, I think like a little bit more of a run here. They played one postseason game last year. I know that Curry's going to be playing the Olympics. Maybe that, you know, but like, I don't know how, really how heavy of a lift it is to play for team USA when you, ha when you're just so, so loaded. Right. But they've had a, they're going to have a really long off season to get rested, get back together, you know, be feel rejuvenated coming into the season I think this is a pretty good opportunity for them to attack a Western conference. That was just an absolute war zone in the playoffs. So being, getting able to, being able to sit out for a year and then being able to recalibrate the team without really having to deal with not that like, I think Chris Paul going to the Spurs shows that like his, the ego isn't really there as much anymore, but like last year they had to deal with Chris Paul and like whatever ego that he still had attached to him and Clay Thompson and whatever ego he still had attached to him as well. I think that now, Kerr can really recalibrate this team and say like, all right, we know it's Curry. We know that Draymond's playing. We know you two are playing. Everybody else is like fungible. We're going to figure it out and we're going to put the best lineups out there. So I think there's a little bit more optionality here and they're not as tied to like their roots or so to speak of the dynasty. Okay. I'll go to mine. Detroit Pistons over 22 <laughs> And a half. I had to fight for this one Dog. Uh, with Jim Turvey. He and I pulled over a wishbone, and I came out with the one that <laughs> get, get to give this one out. Uh, I'm going to be on Pistons all year, and this I'm not betting them a bunch of different ways. I'm not going to bet them on division. I'm not going to bet them for title. There are individuals that are going to be betting them in the in-season tournament. You can read about that on ActionNetwork.com this week. I will not name those individuals, but you can read about those individuals' uh, take on that. Uh, that is not going to be me, but I am going to love this over, and I'm going to probably play a small ult on it as well. Um, one, to me, this is like an absolutely terrific buy low spot. It does not get lower than you lost the most games in NBA history in a row. It does not get lower than you were an absolute, absolute joke when everyone like absolute like completely trashed you. You th your owner had to fire the coach that he begged to come and overpaid him to convince him to take a job he did not want. It's all bad, but if you look, but that's the thing. Like this is what's great. This is the perfect buy low opportunity. If you watch the back half of last year, Cade really turned a corner to me. There was efficiency and there was real impact. He started to look like. An, a, an actual engine of an offense. I don't need it to be a good offense. I just need it to be something that gets off of the ground. I don't need it to fly all the way across the Atlantic. I just need it to make it like, I don't know, two, 300 yards in, like get, get past the breakers. That's all I'm asking the plane to do here at 22 and a half. And then here's the big thing. They added NBA players. I talk about this all the time. A good way to evaluate an NBA team is ask yourself how many NBA players there are on that roster. And you go, well, they're, they're all signed to contracts, Matt. They have to be NBA players. No, what I mean by that is how many guys are going to be in the league in three years? How many of the guys that are on this roster do you know are going to be in the NBA in three years? And a lot of the rebuilding teams will roster guys that honestly they're seeing, like, hey, maybe, maybe we find something here. Or maybe not, and we're able to get Cooper Flag next year. You're going to see that a lot from various teams. Um, the cool thing about the Wizards is that they take guys who may not be in the league in three years, and they pay them like $50 million. So that's like a cool thing the Wizards have going for them. Uh, Malik Beasley. He was terribly cast as a perimeter de shutdown defender with the Bucks. That never made any sense. You know what Malik Beasley is? A perfectly competent two-guard that can hit shots. He's a good shooter with good athleticism who plays. Good play. Like, not a great player. Perfectly fine. 
slightly above average. Tobias Harris, I totally get it. Absolute bag getter, complete letdown in Philly. Did not, I guess, carry the MVP that gets paid $50 million the way that he needed to. (laughs) Tobias has been in the league forever. He's going to get you points, rebounds. He's going to understand how to space the floor. It's perfectly competent. Paul Reed, very competent backup center who I like more than all the rest of their other 1,700 centers that they had. They got rid of James Wiseman, who, by the way, was one of the worst impact players in the league last season. All of this combined with J.B. Bickerstaff, I love this fit. I love this fit. J.B., we had problems with the playoff stuff, but regular season, back-to-back, like three seasons in a row, J.B. has had that team in position to win 50 games and had them playing great defense, developing individually, and taking steps forward. I'm not saying that this number is wrong. I get why it's 22 and a half. They have to put it. I love these bets where I'm like, I know you have to put that at 22 and a half, but it's wrong. So Jim Turvey, Pistons Island, over 22 and a half is my best bet. I am. I am drinking the pina colada next to you on Piston, Pistons Island for sure. I, you know, you referenced some people talking about the IST. Maybe we, we won't spoil the episode, but I think some people are on this call right now. So it's definitely very high on the Pistons in general. Um, you mentioned J.B. Bickerstaff as a coach they brought in, and I, I'm with you that I think that that's a great fit. He's going to do really well with them. They also brought in Fed, Fred Vinson, and for a team that needs shooting, he's been able to turn, you, you look around the league, he's been able to turn some guys who aren't really shooters into shooters. That's exactly what the Pistons need. You know, maybe you start the season with Malik Beasley in that two spot. He works with, you know, Asor Thompson. He suddenly starts to be able to shoot. Then you don't have to stress the spacing as much. Beasley can be a guy off the bench. Fontecchio, I really liked what he did in Detroit. I think the, the key thing, though, is like you said, there's just competent individuals here. And the bottom of the East is really, really bad. Now, the fear here is this is a really good draft. And I do think that there we will see teams that are very intrigued by the draft. But I think the Pistons have been losing so long. And if they are in a season where they're finally, if things are finally clicking, they brought in Tobias Harris, like th- they have a decent floor to, I'll, I'll tell you what, the, 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 the end of the play-in bracket is also going to be very available in the East as well. They're going to look at those two options. I think with the amount of losing they've had over the number of years they've had, it's going to be really hard for them to, to fully, you know, Rip, rip the break again and, and go into full tank mode. I think they're going to be closer to competing for the play-in spot. I'm going to be intrigued by, you know, how long of a number we can get on them to at least get into that play-in spot. I don't think the ceiling for them is is to join the top six, but they're like that, the kind of the inverse of the Suns bet last year where we were like, I don't think they're going to be in the top six, but I don't think they're going to be below 10. This is like, I don't see them going above six, but I don't, you know, I don't. I, I kind of intrigued by them to get to that ten spot. So them to be in the play in is also an interesting way to play them. Um, and I, you know, I, I I'll say this in terms of the in season, we don't have to go too deep into it here, but I think that there's intrigue in that as well because you know maybe maybe they do struggle again out of the gate and they they do want to pull the break at some point. They'll have all the pieces for the in season tournament. They're they're not those guys are going to be there even if they do want to you know eventually. Hit hit the hit the tank. I don't think they will, but we know that they're going to have the guys for the in season on a on a roster that looks pretty good. So I I, I like hitting the ceiling then at that point as well. Um, but yeah, just overall, I'm I'm beyond Pistons Island with you with with the pina colada. Yeah, you're. Right. I I think you are uh, the governor of the, the <laughs> of the Commonwealth of Pistons Island. Like I'm at my my numbers have them at 27 and a half. I want to bump them up higher, but I can't like I I can't with how bad they were last year, make any more of a jump on this based off of, Hey, you got Tobias Harris and Malik Beasley and Caden and Ivy should be better. And your coach maybe makes a little bit of sense. I th- I think there is a world of internal development that can really help here. And that pushes them like that. My numbers don't account for that except for in very specific circumstances. I'll give teams like a half point to a, to a quarter point bump, but with the Pistons, I, I just feel like one, this is a really known low number. And I just, I, I really, uh, I am all in on them being a respectably bad NBA team versus a, uh, <laughs> versus a absolutely dreadful one. Even Joe, last, you talk to into it? 
even last year they had they had outside of the mega losing streak i was that was a team i, I was betting on the spread often because they were they were really interesting outside of that one big terrible losing streak they i'm sorry i cut you off joe but they were no. they were fun to bet on last year other than that time that they lost the most games in nba <laughs> history they weren't other, bad other that's, than that that's unbelievable joe. that's an unbelievable like let's forget about this moment <laughs> but uh like i i can't hate it usually i feel like these really low win totals like they're they're deceiving sometimes because they're i'm like am, am i just being like drawn into a number that i think is really good or is it like this team is just bad like they're so bad like they're gonna be way under this like it doesn't even matter so I, my biggest concern is like i think that a lot of the guys that they brought in like malik beasley even like tim hardaway jr tobias harris they got b-ball paul um I, a lot of these guys i'm like are they gonna keep them are they gonna trade like what are they gonna do with them um because i do question like yeah maybe they start off like decently well um but then they, they kind of get to a point where they're just like ah eh, like we're not gonna make we're not gonna get to the play in um let's you know it's a trade deadline let's let's move beasley let's move hard away let's move tobias harris like let's move well tobias harris contract i don't know if you're moving that but um you know some of these guys right like maybe maybe they decide to move them and then it changes the roster composition it changes kind of the way that i would attack them further down the season um for me it's a stay away but I, I could definitely be interested in betting on them on like a relatively nightly basis. <laughs> Can I hop in there real quick just to, to follow up on Joe's point? Because I think it's a very good point. But I actually think it actually is even more, not more reason, but I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Because I think because they keep regular season win totals up throughout the year, yeah. I think if you get that number, they start off decent and then we start to see them sell off pieces. You can kind of try and get the, the juicy middle. You know, once they... If you if you think they're hitting the tank, it, yep. the number might be up around like thirty one and a half. We might now have nine wins of middle to be able to try and land the plane on on both the over and the under. Yeah, it's smart. Nice, uh, Joe. Oh, before we do that, real quick, I just want to let you know uh, bottom three teams in win total rank. So if you rank all the teams preseason by win total, then this is one of the worst three teams in the league. Um, I looked over the last 12 years of data, which is when I have data available, 16 and 10 to the over. It's not a huge advantage, but it does tend to go over more than under, which is significant given that the unders are still a very good overall play in a lot of circumstances, including teams off of injury. Not that we're going to talk about one of those teams coming up. Wait, Matt, can I actually follow up on that point really quick? Because I because I'm intrigued by a few of the like really bad team unders this year, and I'm curious if you think that that gets impacted by draft class because this draft class supposedly is like it's got the stars and it's got some depth. I think we could see like the mega tank on again. Do you think that that is more? Does that impact that trend, or is it a little bit trend proof? I think we probably. I think I need to go back and look at it uh, year by year in order to be able to really evaluate it. Yeah. Right. I think like last year is a very interesting one. The play-in tournament has negated so much of this too. Where yeah, yeah. I will. I will. Like I will say. I think actually the play-in tournament. I want to look at the. I want to look at the play-in era because it's like oh more teams are competitive and trying kind of. But what's actually kind of happened is it's created more desperation amongst teams five through ten. Yeah. Where they're like we have or not even five through ten five through eight those teams are like we gotta get the fuck out the play in and so they don't screw around as much because they're not just like look it's if we if we're sixth versus eight i don't really care if we're six versus seven i don't really care now they're like i care very much about six versus seven i don't want to play in the play-in tournament and so i think that what the result of that on the other end is that the bad teams don't catch them as much throughout the course of the season especially late in the year that's a theory, though. I'd have to go back and look at it. But I do think that with this being a very good draft class, like, yeah, I think I'll just <laughs> – so, some of these teams, like, yeah, I think we're probably going to want to go ahead and go in on the under, um, even if there's some of the – but, uh, well, you know, as the season goes – or off season goes on, I'm going to talk about it. It's going to be really tough because I think that's priced in pretty heavily in a lot of these yeah. situations. Like, yeah. the net number, I'm kind of like, ooh, 19 – ooh, that – I don't know about like they still have some NBA guys. Yeah. But we'll talk about that another time. Um Jim, I want to I want to go to yours and I want to go cuz I need your help with this one cuz this one is it, it tears at me. And the Boston Celtics won the NBA title. I don't know if you, if you knew that. The Boston Celtics have the highest number in the market at 58 and a half. That's not Warriors numbers, but it's a really freaking high number. 
give me your reasoning for why you want Boston under 58 and a half. So I, I wanted this under um, in large part because I felt like last season they were pretty healthy throughout the course of the season. Obviously, Porzingis, you know, they dealt with some injuries to Porzingis, but um, that's just generally that's just generally the way it goes with Porzingis. Like he's not you, he's not generally playing the entire season for you. Uh, he played 57 games. Uh, you know, Al Horford still played 65 games as well. But other than that, they, they pretty much had pretty good health from their main stars, Tatum, White, Brown on holiday my biggest concern with boston is you just had another deep playoff run uh you're the reigning champs maybe you don't care as much about the regular season this year um because you know you're just saying like hey we just saw what happened to the denver nuggets when they were chasing the one seed and it didn't work out so well for them uh you know it's like they they seem to get tired they seem to get a little bit beaten up um so i wonder if that's going to be a factor this year for boston the other thing with boston is they didn't bring in anybody new. They re-signed. They, they basically kept everyone, which is fine. Like, they're the best team in the NBA, obviously. But I, ha- I do have concerns. We know that Porzingis is going to miss pretty much through, I think they said, like, December or so. So we already know he's missing a big chunk of the season. I know a lot of people don't tune into the NBA until Christmas, but there's still a lot of games before that. So that impacts the team. It impacts the minutes, the load that some of these other guys have to carry. And three of the Boston like stars are playing for Team USA. So they just went from playing in the finals, playing this deep playoff run, to now you have Tatum, White, and uh, not Brown, Holiday, uh, playing for Team USA. And that's going to take them through some of August. Like these guys, like they're not, they're none of them are old, but like, you know, Drew Holiday's still, Drew Holiday's 33. Um, Everybody else is in their 20s, but still, like, that's a lot of minutes. That's a lot of traveling. It's a lot of basketball for these guys to play. So I think that it could impact some of their minutes that they have at the beginning of the season. And, 58 and a half is just so many wins. And I think that Boston feels that they're relatively matchup proof. I don't think Boston cares who they play in the playoffs. Like they could be one, two, three, four. I think as long as they feel like they're getting a home game in the first round of the playoffs, they're not really going to care. So to me, this is not a team that I think is going to be pushing to get hit like a 60 win season. And I think that they're just going to be looking at it and saying like, Hey, we got to stay healthy. We need to be like, calibrated we need to be locked in for the playoff run we don't want to see what happened to the denver nuggets happen to us i I like the under 58 and a half it's very tough for me um i'm really trying to figure this one out jim i want you to weigh in before i get into a bunch of trends and numbers yeah so i'll uh you know one of my favorite shows of all time is how i met your mother they've got the pros and the cons on the the yellow legal pad this to me is like i've got two i think i'm with you matt i've got a couple on the pros and a couple on the cons i think it's overall pretty good number i actually have them projected a little bit higher but i'm I'm nervous to play for, I'll start on the con side. It is an insanely high number. And like you said, with, you know, going over on the really low numbers, I, if I remember correctly, the inverse is true to go under on the really high numbers. Everything kind of just comes towards the middle, basically. But I will say, I I do think that this Celtics team of all the teams that, you know, at at the top has better depth to be able to handle us. Like I love, even, even with Porzingis out and Horford 38, I, I'm such a sucker for those. Their 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 backup front court of like Xavier Tillman, uh, Luke Cornett, and I don't even know. I, I got to learn how to pronounce this guy's name better. What's the what's the like Kita? What's what's his name? Oh, Kita Basti. Yeah. There. No. 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 Um. The, the, Nima? Oh, well, this is bad podcasting, but there. Yeah. Yeah. Joe. I think it's Nemus or Nima. I, Nemus, Nemus. Oh, Nemus Kita. Yeah, Nemus Kita. <laughs> Nemus Kita. I was hoping somebody's going to confirm. Definitely a little, right. little advanced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's right. Um, and then, then the other thing. But then, if I go back to the cons column, they do have the Olympic thing. And Matt, do I remember right that they are one of the teams that go abroad before the season as well? That is correct. So that's a double dip there of, you know, like setting themselves up for, you know, potentially some folks missing time. But then if I go back to the pros column, I don't think there's any team better set to handle players missing time because they don't have any one player that it matters if they miss time. They We saw them like I, I remember betting them last year and like Tatum would be out and it would move the spread like a couple points because even though Tatum's a very good player, they just don't have the star player that's going to move the spread if they're out. They just have such good depth and pieces to slot in. They're so well coached. I they kind of can stumble their way to 55 wins. And I and I do think that, you know, last year, Matt, you and I were so big on the Denver under of like, they're not going to push. They're off a title. Why would they push? I, I don't know why they pushed, but they did. And it burned us on the on the win total. And so I don't want to be like, oh, they have, 
you know, they, they are off a title. They're not going to be as motivated to win regular season games. I don't know if that's really a thought process I want to use in my capping anymore. Yeah, the, the, actually, the my bigger issue is, one, the number, just because I have them power rated at 63. They were the, like, they're the same team they were last year. I had them power rated as a 63 win team. I don't, uh, even with the loss of Porzingis, I can't downgrade them enough to get them to this to an under here so that's the number standpoint two jim kind of touched on it it's less a matter of pushing this is the thing with the celtics i find so admirable and i really respect about them they have walked the line of we are going to give good professional prepared effort every night without overextending ourselves so they don't have like these nights where they blow teams out by 40 and are running up the score and talking shit. And then the next night it's like, yeah, they might lose to whoever, like if they get caught, it's usually like, no, they genuinely had like a ter a terrible travel spot. They've won seven in a row. It was a bad spot versus a desperate team. They didn't have it. They were banged up and they lost. Right. Or like the shooting variance thing. They're, for a team that is so reliant on shooting variants, they are remarkably consistent with their regular season effort. And that is not a team that I want to go against on any sort of number. Here's the other side of it, though. Uh, I looked up top three ranked win totals. So if you have a top three win total that season, in preseason, what, how often do those teams go over or under? And the record is 27 and 14 to the under at yep. 65%. So this is not a shock. The best teams are very, uh, and you're going to hear me talk about this a lot over the course of the off season content. If you're new, if you're a long time listener, you've heard me talk about it for years. 50 is a key number in NBA. 52 and a half is a key number in NBA. 55 is a key number in NBA. If you're above those figures, your chances of going under are get higher and higher and higher. Why? The NBA is hard. <laughs> It's really difficult. And it's like, hey, they have such great depth, though. Okay, but what happens if they also, like, they lost Porzingis, White's out a month. Uh-oh, now Drew Holiday has to play a bunch more minutes, and that's not good because he's getting up there. So you're talking about more Hauser or Peyton Pritchard minutes, and that's not very good. So, like, these things can actually catch up with them pretty quickly. I, I think I'm just going to leave this one alone this year. I may talk myself into an under. I think Joe's right that, like, I think the sharp side is an under. I just don't know if I'm brave enough to actually do it. So we'll see if we can get there. Um, let's go to Jim. And I need to hear uh, exactly what the fuck this is, because you have the Atlanta Hawks over 34 and a half, sir. And I would love to know why you're taking what was literally very close to being the worst ATS team in NBA history last season. <laughs> Uh, on the over after they traded their starting their starting two guard, uh, give me the cap on Atlanta over thirty four and a half. Yeah, Detroit were like sitting next to each other, kumbaya, having pina coladas together. This island, I am it, it's me and Wilson the volleyball. I think are, are the only people. I will say, <laughs> Brandon did tell me he is coming around on Hawks Island potentially. So I might have I might have a buddy here. I don't think he's as high on them as I am, but I will say I, I think that there's there's a couple factors here. One. I was high on them last year and I'm a stubborn SOB. And even though everything went wrong last year, I do still think that having Quinn Snyder in there with a roster that has potential intrigues me. Now, I think the DeJounte Murray thing could very well be addition by subtraction. I, the, my biggest worry is that right now they don't have a great backcourt mate for Trey Young. But I think there's actually a decent amount of options out there. I don't really want Buffkin there. I mean, if, if you bring in, there's Tyus Jones, there's Spencer Dinwiddie. There's Marco Fultz. My pick for this team that I really want, that, and you guys, I know this will get made fun of. It got made fun of in Slack already. Dennis Smith Jr. next to Trey Young, I think, could be really, really interesting. He quietly has made himself yeah. into a really good defender. I think he would play perfect next to Trey. I, I really like it. So th these are guys that they could bring in easily. If they don't bring in these guys, you know, I'm not going to love it quite as much. So you might, 
you know, we, we talked about before this pod, what's your favorite? What do you want to attack this second? I, I'm going to like this number regardless. If they bring in one of those guys, especially Tyus or Dan Smith Jr., those are the two that really pop to me. I'm going to really like this. And that's not the type of player who's going to move a win total very much. So if you want to, you can wait and see if they do kind of run it out as is. And then it's like, all right, I, I definitely like the over, but not quite as much. But, you know, Trey, Trey was playing really well overall last year until he missed time. He was basically playing at a net neutral defense, which for him is excellent. And his offensive numbers were as good as ever. When he came back the season, they'd lost the rope a little bit. His defensive numbers cratered. That's not surprising. Trey's not the type of guy who, you know, when the tough gets going, <laughs> you really necessarily want to be on the defensive side of things. But if he can be that that net neutral defender, if he's got a Tyus or a Dan Smith Jr. next to him to help out as well, I think that could be a really nice backcourt. I want a full season of Jalen Johnson. Uh, you know, he did struggle with injuries. He has struggled with injuries at times. I literally wrote an entire column called the Jalen Johnson All-Stars. I love him so much. I think he's the type of player who is worth more to the spread, to the win total, to anything you want, than, he, than it's going to show up in the box score. Um, they, I also kind of like the guys they brought in for... Um, DeJounte Murray, Larry Nance and Dyson Daniels. I think Nance is like the perfect type of guy in this front court to kind of stabilize things. Great defender. Dyson Daniels has flashed really good defensive potential. Uh, actually, defensive just like outright good at defense so far and some offensive potential at times I think is pretty interesting. Clint Capella actually by the numbers was pretty good last year. I've never been that big of a Capella guy. I always wanted more on Yeka Okwangu, Okongu, but that's kind of the point. They, they have a lot of optionality here. And I think one of the biggest things here is that they, the San Antonio has their draft pick. They have no motivation to pull the plug at all. So they're going to be they're they're going to be chasing that you know tenth seed as much as they can. Uh, I, I really think you know De, uh, DeAndre Hunter is a name I haven't even mentioned. We all loved him a couple of years ago. If one of him or Jalen Johnson can pop, stay healthy on the wing, I like both of those guys a lot. So I just, there's a lot of pieces here. There's a good coach in Quinn Snyder. It feels like last year was basically everything went wrong and they're basically rolling the ball out at the same win total this year. So I, I know that the, the ATS numbers were terrible last year, but to me, that kind of tells me that this is a team that the market kind of kept believing in all year and that maybe they were kind of a sharp team that over and over the Sharps liked and they just sucked and they had basically the season from hell. Now, if we can get them being priced as the terrible season from hell team, if there's only, there's only one way to go, it's up. It didn't work for them, but it might just work for us. <laughs> this big uh, uh, Tobias Funke <laughs> energy coming over here. So I'll say this. You know, I think I like the add of Dyson Daniels. Like, he doesn't grade out high in my offseason uh, movement page, but I, I just think he's a good add. I just think he's a good player and is going to be a, a positive contributor for them. Trey had a weird shooting season. He had a, it, it heated up, so it wound up better from three later on. He was 14th percentile at the rim last season at 54.8. He was really good in mid-range, and, he, and then he only shot 37% from three. When he was shooting, like, the first two months, I was like, what is happening with Trey Young's shot? He was at, like, 30%. So, in a lot of ways, I think Trey was very underrated with how well he played last year. The downside of this is that it just seems like everyone kind of sucks playing next to Trey Young. And I don't know what to do with that. Like, that's a trope. But it also kind of feels like that. Yeah. And I don't know really, like, what to do with it. Um, Capella's, only, Capella's only 29. He's going to be 30 this season. Like, Forever. it's crazy because he feels like he's – it feels very much like he's 37. They've tried to move him about 100 times, and they cannot find a contract swap that makes sense for them. They did move off AJ Griffin because he and Quinn never got along. It just was bad from the start. And so they, they booted him to Houston. I think he'll actually turn it around. I still like him. Um, Bogdanovich is still good. Like you're right. Like there are NBA players on this roster, like, like Bogdanovich, Deandre Hunter, you mentioned Jalen Johnson. Um, like they have city, like they have NBA players on this roster. Okay. I just wind up still kind of getting into a position where I'm like, okay, they weren't good and they lost a good player because I think DeJounte Murray was good. And the question is just like, how much do you think he is now? I don't like, I don't, this isn't like the under is not one of my best bets, right? I'm not like excited to bet an under at 34 and a half. The pick motivation I think is, is significant. Um, I think this is one that I would rather look at and bet in season because if they start 
in a way where it's like, hey, they're not like 15 and two, but like they start off and it's like, hey, they're like seven and five and had, or they're six and five and they lost three really tough games. We might have an opportunity for a live. I need proof of life here, Jim. Like I need to see that this team actually is going to listen to Quinn Snyder and is going to translate because the defense stuff is so bad. Joe, are you with him on uh, this? Uh, I, I think I lean over. Ar- archipelago? Right. Of, uh, is it Atlanta Archipelago? <laughs> Atlanta Archipelago. I lean over. Um, I don't feel super strongly about it. Uh, it, to me, it's just like, well, I think you're, I think you kind of nailed it, Matt. To me, it's like, I need to, let me see it. Show me something. Uh, because otherwise it's like, yeah, maybe they just tank again and then see like if they can get a guy that can fit in along with what they have. So, um, that, yeah, it does nothing for me. <laughs> Man, it's the Hawks. <laughs> it's the Hawks. Uh, all right. Well, I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll bring one out that I know is going to do something for you, which is, uh, make you mad. Uh, I like the New York Knicks under 52 and a half. So I don't I don't think the 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 Mikhail Bridges I heart swap in swap out is a net positive. I don't think it's like a huge negative and I think that it allows for a lot of really good things. It allows for a lot of redundancy. It covers if OG misses time, which he typically does. Uh it increases the number of like versatile shooting wings that they have, which it feels like you cannot get enough of in the NBA playoffs, but this is a regular season figure. And I heart was so instrumental to their success sustaining after Mitchell Robinson's injury. The counter to that is that the three of us were on podcast being like, well, should we bet Mitchell Robinson for DPOY? Cause like he's been great. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm like, they lost I heart. They're screwed. Um, if they trade Julius Randall and they get like a good return there and they kind of reconfigure things, maybe I'll be into it. I talked about this when the Knicks were making their playoff run, any changes to this roster means you lose some of that chemistry from last year and the chemistry being such a big part of why they made that push to me is like something where it's very ephemeral and it's very delicate and it's hard to replicate and sustain. And so I'm going to be very curious to see kind of how this goes. Uh, on top of that, I just can't get there from a metric standpoint. I just... I am unable to find a way to uh, locate this. I have them considerably lower. I I don't necessarily love my number. I think I'm probably going to bump them up in manual power rating and get them closer to like 48, 49, but I don't necessarily love them as a 50 win team. And so getting them at 52 and a half here, I get why this number is the way that it is. I'm not saying that I'm like, this is a wrong number. What is this number? No, I get it. They should be really good. I'm willing to go ahead and go the other way here Teams with a 52 and a 50 or more, that, that trend has been very solid. I'm going to go, I need to, not that I needed to, I want to find teams that I want to fade with win totals over 50 and especially over 52. The Knicks qualify as one of the two along with the Nuggets. So I'll take the under 52 and a half, Joe. Yeah. I mean, I think that the number is high, right? Like 52 and a half is a pretty significant jump. Like the, that's, those are numbers that we're seeing. Obviously like the Knicks are based on the odds, like they're title contenders this year. Um, so I, I get like where the number is like coming from, but it does seem, it does seem high, uh, just from like a betting perspective, maybe because I'm not used to it, uh, seeing a Knicks total up there. Right. But I think it's the highest since 97, 98, uh, or, or 99, one of the, one of those years. Right. Um, to me, I, I do have some hesitancy to like value Harshstein as, as much as like, I, like I know he's really good. I think that he's really important. I think he was really important for the team last year. I think he's going to be pretty important for the Oklahoma, Oklahoma city thunder this coming year. My, my one concern is obviously it's just like, I think he's been good before, but he'd never really done it before either. So like, I think that it was important last year, but then to say like, well, he was going automatically going to do the same thing again. I, like, I don't know. Um, whereas Mitchell Robinson, I do know that his defense is incredible as long as he's on the floor. Um, and I do know that, you know, bringing in a guy like Bridges, who I think the chemistry should work out pretty fine, uh, given who else is on the Knicks. Um, I think that there is a higher floor for the team uh, just based on the fact that Bridges never misses games. Um, Randall missed a lot of time, uh, you know, obviously the back end of the season. And I think that he, 
I keep I'm so conflicted on Randall as a Knicks fan. Like, like, is he helpful? Is he not helpful? Like, what's the situation? But I do think that from a regular season perspective, he's an innings eater and he's going to take a lot of load off of guys like Brunson or Bridges or or whoever from a scoring perspective, from like an if from like an attacking the basket perspective. So I, I think that they have to almost build his value back up in order to move him. And then if you build his value back up, do you then want to move him? Um, because I think the contract's not crazy, especially the way that these contracts are kind of just exploding now. So I think that you're probably right in terms of like the under. Uh, to me, I would rather stay away from it. And I think that like, I would want to say, like if I'm looking at the Knicks, because you have a coach like Tibbs, I would, I would want like, they're either going to be in like the play-in because somebody gets hurt or I want them to like win the division. I want them to have like 55 wins. I want them to maybe have 60 wins. I want them to be like the one seed. I want like the opposite, like the farthest ends of the spectrum on the Knicks, as opposed to like, yeah, they're going to be right at the win total. The uh, the data, and I got to clean up some of this stuff on uh, the injury stuff because it's hard to peg and it varies because guys miss way more time than they used to. Um, the I'll just say this, that generally speaking, in the last 13 years, the under has been very profitable on teams the year after they have a lot of injuries. The If you're thinking like, what's the logic there? The market over corrects for thinking that they're going to get healthier and injuries are not, you know, some of it's logical in terms of like you suffer an injury and then you're just hurt and you never, you know, you don't recover. But there's also just like an assumption of like, well, they had terrible injury luck last year. Yeah, they had terrible injury luck last year. This is a new year. It's not going to, it was heads last round, last you know, we flipped heads. Now it's not going to be, be the other. That's yeah. not how it works. Um, so there's no real balance there. Jim, I am I am a little surprised that you were with me on this Knicks under. I am not only with you, but so I, I chose five that I wanted to attack now. But if I had given out the five that I had the biggest delta between the number I have and the number the market has, the Knicks would be in it and very much so on the under. I, I am with you. Yeah, you know, my my Knicks fandom is, is nervous about this year, I guess you could say. I just think that the, you, that playoff run was so grueling and i know brunson every single step of the way has proven people doubting him wrong and wrong and wrong he is a small guard who was dinged up as hell by the end of that playoff run and so much of what the knicks do goes through him when he is not out there the offense i mean it, if he's out i guess you know it, it's then a randall and, and bridges type of offense it could get really ugly really fast i just think that that, that playoff run was so grueling and and the other big, big part, it's been mentioned here a bunch, but Hardenstein was so essential. And if I had faith in either Julius Randall or Tibbs being fine with Randall at the five, I'd be like, all right, yeah, let's. I, I have a little bit more faith that that he can kind of fill in some of those backup center minutes, or if if Mitch if Mitch gets hurt for a stretch, he can play the five for a bit. I don't like OG and Nobi. I don't want OG at the five at all during the regular season. That's a recipe for him to be injured within a week. You do that in the postseason for a few minutes because you you need to. That's not a, a sustainable path. So I my worry, my only worry here is that Tibbs is, you know, he's not going to be like grueling playoff run. All right, let me, you know, put it in the coast mode. He's going to just keep it going. And it's a front office that clearly is all, all, all in. So maybe they address the center role at some point. Maybe halfway through a season, they make, uh, you know, they don't have all that much room to do things, though, I think is the, the easy counter to that. But I am, the, the coaches so go for it. The front office is so go for it. And it is a good, listen, it's a good team with a lot of chemistry. And I, I think there's a lot to like here. But I, I have a lot of nervousness about that the the playoff run that, that, that Knicks team went through and a, a, Garden Jalen Brunson that, you know, again, I, I you know, he, this can go, we can clip it for him when, when I doubt him and he if, and understandably goes above it, but it, it, there's a lot of worries for me on, on the health front with, with Tibbs just pushing guys and just grinding them into dust. We will go through the rest of our bets in a lot quicker order here because we are towards the end of the episode. Uh, I will go through mine real quick to give the guys kind of a sense of what I'm looking for on these caps. Thunder over 56 and a half. I have them projected for 63. Like, I just think that they're going to be an incredibly – like, I am having to take a plunger and stuff them back down into the pipe to keep them from crawling out and destroying the world. Like, I want to have them as my top power-rated team and I'm having to fight them off. Now, look. The numbers I'm using are extremely generous towards Alex Caruso and Hartenstein. They got those guys for nothing. 
They got him for Josh Giddy. This is not a problem. Like this is going to, the off season stuff is going to be like, Oh yeah, you should upgrade that. Like my numbers, like I spat yeah. that stuff out and was like, Oh God. Oh God. I have like the, th like, it wasn't like they're the best team of all time, but it was like, you can see it from there. And I was like, okay, let's, let's maybe calm down a little bit. But the problem is just the books are still like, it's a young team. They won around this much last year. Yes. They got better. I'm not going to overreact. Like we, they're not going to overreact and put them right where they were last year. It's 56 and a half. I think that they like, I don't have a way if it's like, yeah, but injuries. Okay. But what team is better suited to have injuries than this team? Whereas, Oh no. Case and Wallace estimate. Good thing. They got Alex Caruso. Oh, Alex Caruso's hurt. Good thing. They got Lou Dort. Oh no. Chet Holmgren has to miss a week with an ankle injury. They have Isaiah. Like they are just, it's guy on guy. It is just an endless stream of wings and versatile players that all know how to play for a, a great coach. And they're all young and they're still hungry. I'm taking the over 56 and a half uh, Pelicans over five forty five and a half. My stuff really likes DeJounte Murray. And I agree with it. Like I agree with what the number spits out here. I actually think this is a pretty big upgrade. If they trade Brandon Ingram, I will be hitting the division futures. That's kind of where I'm at. Uh, I just think the Pelicans are, are probably going to be, I think the, I have the Pelicans closer to a 50 win team. I think it's gonna be very close between them, Memphis and Dallas for who wins the division. And I'm probably going to like the Pelicans number for the win of the division by the end of it. Uh, nuggets under 52 and a half. Guess what? This is another like, I need I I want teams that have a win total over 52 so I can take an under Denver got worse for the second year in a row I don't trust Christian Brown Michael Malone has managed to go over and 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 over now that we got a good number last year where the closing number went over but the opening number went under last year so I snuck in there and got an under on the on on the nuggets last year but it is going to be like, it's close. And I do think that Nikola Jokic is worth probably 50 wins. I'm willing to go ahead and, and take the under on this, especially with Jokic and Murray in the Olympics. So that's going to be my, uh, my three thunder over 56 and a half Pelicans over 45 and a half nuggets under 52 and a half. Jim talk to me about Chicago, Toronto, and Houston. Can I lead by saying that uh, I had two of those like lot like Pelicans and thunder. I am in lockstep with you. And again, it was just, I didn't, I wanted to wait for Pelicans. I wanted to wait same with you. I wanted to wait till they got rid of Ingram and then buy, you know, semi low if, if they drop the wind total a little bit. Uh, Denver, I like the under, but the Thunder over, I, I want it as well. And I thought that because of the trend of high wind teams going under, we would see it go under. It's already ticked up a win. It opened at 54 and a half. It went up to 55 and a half. So I might have to just jump on it as well because I'm with you. The Thunder, I could not be higher on them. But for my teams, I, of the three remaining ones, I like the Rockets over 41 and a half uh, the most. This is a team that is is probably my second island of the season. Um, really, really high on Houston. They their net rating last year was right between the Lakers and the Warriors. They by by cleaning the glass, they were more like a forty six win team. They've got and that was missing time from a lot of key players. Shingun missed twenty games. Amin Thompson twenty games. Kim Whitmore missed twenty five games. Tari Eason. Me and Matt's shared love. Tari love Eason that. only played 20 games. So getting him back and depth, depth, depth. I can make the case for 13 rotation players here and a very good coach to manage it all. Fred Van Vliet, Jalen Green, Dylan Brooks, Jabari Smith. They've got so many there of just like solid people, but then they've got, you know, Reed Shepard is already popping off the page. Uh, I mentioned Whitmore and Thompson. They've got solid vets. Jock Landale actually played pretty well last year. And then they've got some boomer bus guys. You mentioned AJ Griffin. I've always liked AJ Griffin as well with a new coach. Hopefully he clicks with Willie Green. Steven Adams, if he comes back, you know, he's he's old at this point, but if he can give them a few games of intrigue there, I just there are so many guys on this team that I really, really like what was a good team remaining a good team and maybe even, you know, popping. I, I'm going to be looking at their division as well because I'm low on Dallas, who's the big favorite right now. And I'm with you on the Pelicans, but I think that the Rockets number is a little bit out of whack because I really like the ceiling to them as well. Um, for Chicago under 30 and a half, this is the time they pull the, pull the plug. I think they've, they've already started shopping some people. They've already traded some people. Uh, Vooch is on the trade block you know this could be a more high, heavier Zach Levine usage season which I think actually could be good towards tanking I think this is uh, a great team to get in on the alt unders maybe bet them for worse record I think this is the year it finally they finally 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 hit the tank um, so I'm gonna be under them and then finally Toronto it's kind of a similar story here this roster is a little bit better but really there's only two guys I like on this team it's Scotty Barnes and Emmanuel quickly if either of them 
gets injured. I think we see exactly what happened last year, which is they are not afraid to fully pull the ripcord and, and go for a draft pick here. Um, they, they clearly are not looking to contend. If you look at their offseason, uh, you know, Gary Trent's unsigned while they've got a bunch of flyers incoming. Uh, the, sh- the, the Barnes stuff too. I, I like Barnes, but a lot of what drove his value when he was like, you know, an all-star to start the season last year was some crazy shooting numbers that I don't think are sustainable. They really are out of whack with the rest of his career. So I, I like the under here. The win total has already come down a win. Again, I'm going to like the alt win total unders on this. These are some of those teams I could just really see their eyes lighting up at this draft class and really trying to go for it. So um, they've got draft pick uh, motivation here to, to tank as well. So I, I really like those two unders uh, from those kind of Eastern Conference, you know, lower tier, which kind of plays, you know, if, if we could parlay them, it'd be nice to get the Pistons over and, and they're under. Because I think the Pistons see the path and they choose winning. And I think Toronto and Chicago see the path and they choose losing. Uh, Toronto makes me nervous just from their signals are very much like, Hey, we gave y- Jakob Pertl and Kelly Olenek all this money and we want to keep them. And they're building around Scotty Barnes and like quickly is a good player. Uh, I have them right on the dot on the number. So I'm, I'm hoping that nothing dramatic happens so I can just like, Nope. Right on the number. Feels good. Looks good. <laughs> no, no, thanks. Uh, I'm with you on Chicago under, I have them at 24. I don't think people really understand like what the loss of like, key veterans does yeah. especially when it's a guy like demar now yeah i'm gonna be hesitant i want to see what happens with vooch and levine where i think those guys are nba players and i'm actually i'm always going to be a little bit high i'm just a little bit higher on zach because i think he got screwed by demar coming over i think it just really stunned his game and they were actually okay before then and like zach levine and kobe white i'm kind of like man that's a lot of scoring um if they do trade Levine, if they figure out a deal and they do move off of him, then I'll definitely be on the all under there because I think they're going to be in the Cooper flag sweepstakes. I think there will be this conversation of like, no, nah, man, like Kobe made the jump. Like, yeah, no, Kobe made the jump last year, but he's not, he has not made the jump to can lift a team to 30 plus wins when it's no. in this kind of state. So I don't, I don't like that uh, at all. You mentioned Houston. God, I'm just, I'm going to gush about their bench all year. Just their bench is like entirely made of guys that I'm just like, he's awesome. And he's awesome. And he's awesome. And he's awesome. And why is Jalen green starting? And he's awesome. And he's awesome. <laughs> and why is Jalen green starting? Um, that would be future Miami heat giant Jalen green. Ooh. Uh, all right, Joe, take us home with you hating on one of the most fun teams. I'm, I'm looking forward to the reaction or slack to this one. You got the under on the magic 47 and a half. Give it to me. Yeah. So I want under 47 and a half to me. I think that I, it's tough to say, I don't know if I want to use the word peaked, but I felt like last season was about as good of a season as this team could have had. Um, they, and you know, what's crazy. They were 16th in adjusted net rating. They were plus 1.4. They could not score. And you added like, I get it. I like KCP. That's their ad. They added KCP. And I'm like, you're, you're not going to go from the 22nd ranked offense based on that. Franz Wagner, love him. I think he's awesome. He's not like the engine of an offense. Paolo, awesome. Love watching him. He's aw- like so fun to root for. Extremely inefficient. Like, I just think that what they did last year, they had a ton of health. And I know like Jim and I, when we were talking, Jim's like, Jonathan Isaac could play more. And I'm like, he played about as many games as he's going to ever play. <laughs> so, um, so it's like, uh, to me, I think that they really had about as good of a season as they possibly could have had. Um, and like, sure, there should be some growth. But at the same time, like they were healthy. I know that they're pretty young for the most part. So maybe the health doesn't make a huge difference. But at the same time, to me, I... I think that it's asking for a lot of growth for this team to basically replicate what they did last year, plus one more win when they didn't do too much else. And I think that the rest of the East got a little bit better. Like Philly got, a, especially at the top, Philly got a little bit better. I think the Knicks got better. Um, the Celtics definitely didn't get worse. So I think Cleveland got better with a new coach. So I think that there's a lot of teams in the East where I'm like, I like, I don't see it. I don't like, I just don't see it for Orlando to get past the 47 and a half mark again and really be pushing on like 50 wins. Like I do not think of the Orlando magic as a 50 win team. And I think this is just too much, a little bit of an overreaction based on the way the, the East kind of like landed last year with a variety of different injuries to the Knicks, to the bucks, to the Sixers. And when you have that, 
and you translate it over to this year, I, I think that the 47 and a half is just too high for, uh, for this Orlando magic team that really just can't score the basketball. So two things here. One, I would say I would wait. And the reason I would wait is they just gave Isaac a bunch of money and they re-signed Goga, yeah. which it's like, that's making a very awkward, like, Hey, Wendell Carter Jr. How are you? And so they, there's been a lot of conversation about them trading him. If he goes to theoretically say the New Orleans Pelicans for CJ McCollum. Now, if you're able to bring CJ off the bench, now you have lineups that probably can score. Cause if you put CJ and KCP on the floor next to Paolo and Franz that that lineup will be able to, you're losing Jalen's defense, but that lineup's probably going to be able to score Yeah, because CJ is just going to raise the, the base competency offensively with shooting and, and ball handling. So I would probably just wait to see what they enter camp with. But if we get to opening like that last week of the season or they go through training camp and it's like, yeah, no, we're this, we're, we're good with this team. Then yeah, I, I think that there's probably a, a little bit of value there. I have it right on the dot. Um, I'm going to have to figure out. Cause like I, a lot of this is, I looked at mine and I was like, oh no, I have more overs than unders, but so many of mine are like, I'm like 0.25 over. Yeah. So I just got to m- figure out whether I want to go ahead and make a manual adjustment and duck some of these down uh, in order to kind of change it. So uh, that's how that works out. Okay. Thanks for joining us. Great episode. Gave you a lot of guys, a lot of best bets. Gave you guys a lot to think about. As a reminder, we will do, Brandon and I will do every single division, every single win total. We'll start that sometime in either August or September. I'm working on Brandon's schedule right now. Uh, We will have episodes next week. Um, We will have episodes on the summer games on Thursday. You can check out an episode with these two gentlemen and me. We're going to talk about NBA futures betting and about tying up your money for a full calendar year. We're going to talk about when to buy in, when to not to. Should you do a portfolio? How do you approach these type of things? Is it worth betting now? Is it worth betting ever? We'll talk about those types of things and more uh, on this podcast. We'll talk to you guys again soon. Thanks for joining us. My thanks to David Payne, our producer, as well as Hutton Jackson and the video crew getting us up at youtube.com slash the action network. Make sure to hit us up on Twitter and let us know what you think of the podcast and what your favorite win total is or hit us in the comments. Let's get talking. <laughs>